Getting into the RTOS basics. Um, so again, uh, a, the purpose of the, the RTOS is to manage task, and the task is is a piece of code that typically you write. There are some internal tasks that are managed by the RTOS, but uh, typically you are the one that are writing the task. So um, a task is assigned a priority based on the important, the importance that you give it. It requires its own stack space. The task could manage variables, array, and structures, and typically implement it as an infinite loop. Now, it could be in, implemented as a straight line uh, return, but when it returns, the task is deleted, and there's no, pur no purpose for that task. So each task is implemented as an infinite loop, and each task waits for an event to occur. So that's what I show in red in the code uh, example below. So, uh, and the task can possibly manage IO devices, and we'll get into that. So in order for the RTOS to know about your task, you need to what's called create your task. You need to tell the RTOS, this piece of code, my infinite loop that I've defined in C somewhere is my task or one of my tasks. And I need to tell the RTOS through a API called, for example, in, in the Microsoft OS 3, it's called OS Task Create. And then you pass it arguments. You pass it the address of the task code, the base address of the stack you're going to be assigning to that task. You're going to tell it how big the stack that you're giving it is, as well as provide a priority to, to the task that you're creating. And I had the dot dot or the, the colons there to indicate there are more arguments in the Microsoft OS 3 OS task create call, but in general, these are the four things that we, you would typically have to specify in the case of an RTOS. Now, some RTOSs don't allow you to specify the base address of your task stack because by specifying the size, the stack is actually allocated from R an RTOS heap, and then that task is actually that task stack is actually assigned to the task. Now, when the when the task create is executed and, and is successful, uh, the RTOS creates uh, a TCB or allocates a task control block, which resides in RAM and populates it with some information about your task. What's the base address of your stack? How big your stack is? What the priority of your task? Uh, where the, what does the stack, uh, the task stack start and so on. And it also assigns a set of CPU registers. Now, you may say, well, the CPU only has 16 registers, so how could it assign it a set of registers? What it does is actually says, I'm going to create, like if you want, a virtual CPU, and I'm going to initialize certain registers to make it look as if I had just entered an interrupt service routine and I saved all the registers on the task stack that I've just created. So whenever the task gets to execute, the RTOS actually restores the CPU registers from the stack and puts it in, in the CPU physical register. Uh, well, before doing that, it actually saves the current task uh, registers onto its task, and then it restores them from the new task that, that needs to run. So I'll get into those details in, in shortly. So each task I mentioned requires its own stack space. So as you can see here, uh, the stack is a certain size, depends on the application. And then the task create call initializes the stack, top of stack, or the beginning of the stack. So you would pass it the base address of the stack. And then by knowing the size, you would know that most stack actually go down. So they decrement the stack pointer by pop and populate the stack frame. So you would actually have the stack pointer point here. You load the PC, the status registers, all the register value that you want the stack or the task to start with. And then, uh, then you leave it like that. And if the RTOS decides that the task that you've just created is more important than the task that was creating it, then at that point, this task would be where you'll be popping the registers off the stack and the task would actually run with the initialized value. So the PC is obviously populated with the base address of the task code or the infinite loop that I showed in a previous slide. 
the status register could be dummy values. R0 could be the argument that you'd want to pass to the task when the task gets started the first place, first time, and so on. So anyways, so there's a whole bunch of information that gets populated in the stack frame when the task is created. There's also a, a stack limit uh, stack limit register that belongs to the Cortex M33 processor, which is kind of a neat thing because the Cortex uh, the uh, Cortex um, it's called a V8M architecture. The Cortex M33 processor has a stack limit register which allows you to detect automatically in hardware if the stack overflows or not. So I'll get into some details about that shortly. So like I mentioned, an RTOS is event driven. So each task is an infinite loop and each task waits for its event to occur. So as you can see here, I have multiple tasks. Uh, the high priority task is here, the low priority task. They all look like they're infinite loop. And then the RTOS's job is to switch into one of these are infinite loops based on the priority. So not all of these tasks are necessarily eligible to run. Some of them are waiting. So some of them have executed all the way to here and they're waiting for their, their event to occur. And then when that happens, the RTOS puts that task to sleep, saves all the CPU registers associated with that task and suspends that task and switches or chooses, selects the next task that is uh, higher in priority than the one that was just executed. So anyway, so only the highest priority uh, ready task gets to execute and a task that is not able to run because it is uh, waiting for an event is placed into a wait list waiting for that event to occur. So what a wait list looks like is this. So for example, the number one task on top, uh, it's waiting for DMA completion to occur. So when that occurs, the, the DMA completion ISR sends a signal through the RTOS indicating that the DMA has completed. The RTOS receives this signal and says, are there any tasks waiting for this DMA completion to, to occur? And if the answer is yes, there's a task waiting. It's in the list here, it's in the green box. And that means the RTOS will say, okay, I'm gonna make this task eligible for CPU because the event it was waiting for has occurred. Now, whether it runs that task immediately or not depends on whether that task is now the most important task in the system. So the same thing happens with other tasks that are waiting for a printer access mutex to be released. I have some slides explaining mutexes and semaphore and all that. So the same thing here in this case, I have three tasks that are waiting for access to the printer. The list is ordered by priority, meaning that if the mutex is in fact released, then the task with the highest priority will get to use the, to use the mutex or access the printer. The other task will have to wait until this task is done accessing the printer and so on. So there's other tasks, other wait lists in the systems. I just wanted to show you an example of what that looks like. So, um, so most RTOSs today are what's called preemptive. So uh, I have three examples, uh, three pieces of code. One is the ISR and then two of which are task code. So again, a task is an infinite loop. Um, and each task waits for an event to occur. So let's presume that we are actually executing the low priority task, which is what's shown on the bottom left of that diagram. So the low priority task is executing the event that a task is waiting for occurs. So that's ha handling through an ISR. So an interrupt occurs while we're executing the low priority task. The interrupt service routine runs a little piece of code that notifies the kernel or the RTOS that, hey, by the way, I am running an interrupt service routine. I'll explain why we do that shortly. So I'm running an interrupt service routine. Let's go ahead and do something. So I, we run in the black here, we run the ISR related code. That ISR code signals the task that this task is waiting for this ISR. It signals the task. And at the end of the ISR, the the RTOS comes in again and says, okay, is there a more important task that is currently waiting for this event? And if the answer is yes, and more important than the task that was running in green, then the RTOS immediately switches to that task, runs that task to completion until it actually says, wait for my event to occur again. And at, at that point, if the event has not occurred a second time, 
then the RTOS resumed what it was doing prior to the interrupt and thus prior to the preemption of the low priority task. So here we execute the low priority task again. So, uh, so also uh, without an MPU, and I'll get briefly into the MPU uh, discussion in a, in a few slides here, but uh, an, an RTOS basically runs alongside with user code in what's called privilege mode, meaning that uh, an RTOS as well as application code could disable interrupt, could change the interrupt controller setting, could do a whole bunch of things. So uh, most RTOSs do this for performance reason. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about the MPU, about you know what that's for and all that, and then the benefits that it has, but it do adds overhead to your application if you're um, using an MPU. And in fact, it, it makes the application a little bit more complicated to design. Uh, but very useful piece of, of hardware if you have that on your or your CPU. So anyway, the reliability of the system is really in the hands of the application code. ISRs and tasks have full access to, mem to the memory address space. So any task or any ISR could tamper with any other task in the system, which often leads to problems. Uh, the task could disable interrupts and thus lock your system up. Uh, tasks that can overflow without detection because without an MPU, there is no physical way to actually detect when a stack overflows when you go beyond the boundary of your of your stack. Uh, code can execute out of RAM. There's no protection against you or, or somebody uh, doing a, a code injection attack and then actually putting code in your RAM and jumping to that code. So unfortunately, without uh, an MPU, that cannot be done. But again, a lot of RTOSs don't run in, in don't run with an MPU, and because of, they do that because of performance reasons. And it's it's expensive to get safety certification for the whole prod, product when your RTOS is not running with an MPU. So again, we'll talk about that. So a quick picture of of what an, a context which looks like again without an MPU. So. Let's say a low priority task gets preempted and we need to, we need to halt that, we need to save that uh, context. So, we, so all the CPU registers are saved onto the task that is being preempted, the task that, the task that was interrupted, as well as the FPU registers. And the task control block that was assigned by the RTOS actually keeps track of where the stack pointer is at the point of preemption. So when uh, an interrupt occurs, the interrupt service routine saves the CPU registers of the task that's being interrupted onto the task stack. And then, uh, then we actually, if we switch to a different task, then we restore the CPU register from that new task, the more important task gets restored from its stack space uh, using the task control block. But that's all handled by behind the scene by the uh, the RTOS or the company that provides you the RTOS.